Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just ask your blessing on this time. Lord, may the words that come out of my mouth be your words. Lord, may your presence be felt here today. Lord, may the things that we discuss help people to walk closer to you. Lord, and if they don't know you, if they aren't walking in your light, Lord, maybe this be the day that they join you in their faith. Amen. Ask this in Jesus' name, amen. amen. So this might surprise you a little bit, but I often struggle trying to meet the expectations of people that people place on me. Um, a lot of times what people think I should be doing is not what I think. Look at you, you're here. <laughs> but it's not what I think I should be doing. They've got this idea of what people are what I'm supposed to be doing, and it doesn't, it's not the same. And I have problems with that. Because I'm all about me. It's selfish. I know. But it's just the way I am. So my goal in life is to not be that way. My goal in life is to change. And to change, not so that you would like me better. That's not important. But that God and God's will is being done in my life. Hallelujah. We talked today in Sunday school. We said, you know, this life is just a short time compared to the eternity that we've got. Now, we, we're eternal beings whether we accept the Lord or not. It's just where we're going to hang out. You know, you could be hanging out with Jesus for the rest of eternity, or you can be in hell, which in my mind is just a total absence of God. I'm sure there's other fun things going on there too, but that's the thing that bothers me the most. So, because I work here during the week, I often fight with myself over the extent of assistance I'm supposed to give individuals. I'm trying to decide the criteria that I'm going to go by in making those individual determinations. Um, I'm trying to decide how much is appropriate, how much is just too much, you know, uh, how much is uh, valuable in my time and how much is just, um, what do we call it, um, um, uh, uh, allowing them to be what they are longer. You understand what I mean? Am I just allowing them to be themselves for an extra three months because I was helping them to further that in their lives. I have no idea what I'm talking about, but that's okay. Yeah. So one of the things that really helped me, and helps me still, is looking at the life of my Lord and Savior Jesus, and how he lived his life on this earth. What he did while he was living here, and walking on this ground. Um, he became a man, didn't have to do that. He was present at creation, at the beginning of the universe. He was part of the triune God. He is eternal, but he gave all that stuff up to be spent 30 some years on this earth. Um, Probably a disappointment, not a vacation or anything like that. It was something he had to do. 
And by becoming a guy and walking around this earth, and you know, he was raised in a small town, his dad wasn't wealthy, he was a carpenter, um, and everybody in that town knew who Jesus was, the bratty kid that, you know, his dad was a carpenter, all that stuff. He lived a life that you and I would live. He lived humanity. Um, here is a God, a boundless, ageless God who had all wisdom, all power, and he became one of you and I. Why did he do that? I think it's so that we could look at him and say, I, I could do some of those things. I can, I can try to be more like Jesus in my life. If he was some magnificent heavenly being, you know, it's like all bets are off. Can't do that. But Jesus walked around this earth like us. Look, Jesus set boundaries in his life. Now he served people to the limit of his ability. By the end of the day, he was exhausted. But he didn't go too far. He wasn't snapping at people because he wasn't rested or underfed. He wasn't going around expecting people to serve him. He took care of himself. And it was important because he had a lot of ministry to do the next day. He had a lot of things he had to accomplish. Now, personally, I think that uh, he set pretty high standards. Yeah. I think that what Jesus was able to do in a given day far exceeds maybe what you and I could do or we think we can do. But with God's help, we can do amazing things beyond what we know about. Amen. So I discovered that in his humanity, Jesus had limitations that he accepted in a realistic way. He lived in a regular human body. Probably didn't have to, but he chose to. One of these bodies here, what do you think? Yeah, <laughs> one of those. So maybe, a few, maybe a few less pounds, but. He needed nourishment every day. He needed rest. He needed sleep. One of the most difficult things, I think, for Jesus was he could only be at one place at a time. And the time was involved, right? Because he had been there at the creation of the universe, at the creation of this earth. He had been there. He'd been, he'd known you and I since before we were born. He knew us when we were just an idea or less. And suddenly he was thrust into this human existence where he had to live day by day, hour by hour, bugs, bad water, bad wine, whatever. Grabbing some ears of grain out of a wheat field, calling that a meal. He lived that way. Why? So that we had a guidepost. We had somebody that we could follow, somebody that we could 
look at and say, okay, this is the way I need to go. This is how I need to function. These are the things that I need to do. Because Jesus did it, I'm going to do it. If you have decided that Jesus was a superhuman being and that you're not worrying about trying to be like him because he is God, then you've already lost. It's important that we try to be like Jesus. Again, like I said, he didn't have to be a human being and walk around on this earth, but he did it for us. He did it so we had somebody we could look at and emulate, somebody that we could try to be like. One of the things I think that we, one of the things that we don't do that I think is super, super important is that he would pull away from people, go spend time by himself in prayer with the Father. See, something that we don't do is take care of our spirit. We don't take care of the spiritual side of who we are. We just figure we can't see it, we can't touch it, so we don't worry about it. But the truth is, Jesus spent a lot of time maintaining his connection with the Father. He had spent a lot of time concerned with his own spiritual health. He knew that tomorrow a bunch of people were going to come his way and they were going to have crises, they were going to have physical problems, they were going to be hungry, they were going to be looking for his help in all kinds of ways. So he had to be charged up. I think sometimes we forget to get involved with that, that we allow our spirit to just dwindle. We allow our spirit to fend for itself and hope that everything turns out okay. God's not taking care of our spirit. We have to take care of the spiritual side of who we are. And we need to feed that spirit and make that spirit strong. We need to grow the spirit. We need to invest in the spirit. I'm probably not considered to be a warm and fuzzy guy. <laughs> and that's okay. Because I saw in the Bible that Jesus wasn't always nice to everybody. He didn't feel that he had to be nice to people who intended him harm, who were undercutting his word, who were trying to do the will of the devil in his midst. Uh, a lot of times he had problems with Pharisees and Sadducees, the religious leaders of that day, the high priests and the people who were in charge of all those people's lives. He a lot of times had some problems with them, right? Yes. Yeah. Yep. A good Christian wouldn't be unkind to religious leaders, would they? That's just not right. There were even people that he didn't help. People that came to him and said, Master, what must I do? You know, he didn't say, hey, come on and hang out with us and we'll have a good time together. And he said, no, you got to do just the things that he knew would be most difficult for that person to achieve. Because he knew that that was a stumbling block for that particular person. And he had to overcome that. So we didn't work up to it. We started with the difficult thing. Even people that he did help. He expected.
expected them to do their part. They had to participate in these things. When the blind man was healed by putting mud on his eyes, Jesus said, you gotta walk to the pool of Shalom, which was more than a mile away. He didn't say, get yourself a glass of water and wash the, wash the mud out of your eyes. He said, you gotta travel all the, he's saying to a blind guy, right? When he had the mud in his eyes, he was still blind. It was not until he washed the mud out of his eyes that he got his sight. Jesus expect, expects faith. He expects you to trust in the things that he's saying. Maybe that guy was like, you know, why, why do I have to go to that pool? And he could have said, you know, I think I got some water at home and I only live a half a block from here. I'm sure if he's a blind guy, he was pretty close to where he lived. So he said, I can just, I can do it my way. I'll just go home and wash the water out of my eyes myself, or the mud out of my eyes myself. Guess what? It probably wouldn't have worked. Jesus made this stipulation, the essential part of this guy's sight restoration. And it, it's not obvious why that would be important. But it was important in terms of that guy's faith and his ability to walk and do the things that Jesus asked him to do. A lot of people started following Jesus when they'd heard that he would provide him with a meal. He did it a couple times, he fed 5,000, 4,000. So pretty soon it was, hey, let's go out and hang with Jesus because we get loaves and fishes. And Jesus said, to them, you need to eat my body and drink my blood. And they're like, no thanks, I guess we'll go eat at McDonald's instead. <laughs> Wasn't a nice thing to say, was it? He could have fed him, because he was God. And he'd done it before, it's not like it would have been the first time. But he wanted people to follow him on faith, not because he was going to give them lunch. So understanding these things helped me manage my life. If you conceptualize what Christians are supposed to be. If you just think about the good that we're supposed to do for everybody, then you just give away all your cash and all your possessions. And you just do that and you give away all your time and you would just give, give, give until you had nothing left to give. And then you'd be, be done, right? I got nothing, I guess I'll go presume upon somebody else for stuff now that I don't have anything. But Jesus took care of himself. Maybe he took care of himself first so that he could serve others through strength, through his body strength, but mainly through his spiritual strength. He ate healthy food, he got sleep, took naps in, in boats sometimes. And he did a lot of walking. That's all good stuff. When he was having a difficult time, when things were tough, he sought the company of those around him, people he trusted. In Matthew 26, starting in 36 says, then Jesus went with them to the mount, 
the olive grove called Gethsemane and he said, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and Zebedee's two sons, James and John. He became anguished and distressed. He told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Okay, he was just a guy. He needed companionship. He needed friendship. He needed love. Sometimes he sought solitude. He would retreat away from the crowds and spend some time for himself. If you, if you, if you look in the Bible, Jesus walked all the way from one town to another. He didn't like materialize in a new place and teach there, okay? He was not in a hurry. He lived the rhythm and pace of life at that time. He walked with his friends from town to town and he ministered there and when he was done ministering there, he walked to another town. I often think that Jesus could have had by far the best mega church ever. Mm -hmm. Jesus could have just got everybody coming to his services on the mountainside or wherever. It would have been awesome, but he didn't do that. If you look at the church that Jesus has built, it is by far the biggest mega church. And you may sit here today and say, well, there's not very many people here. But if you think of all the churches just in Fort Lauderdale, where there's people coming together to hear God's word, to hear about Jesus Christ, then he's built an amazing church. So the elders, and we have been studying a book probably for far too long. Um, it's a book called The Emotionally Healthy Church, uh, written by Peter Scazzaro. And uh, we were recently um, discussing a chapter, and there was a story in it. I want to read you the story. It says, Rabbi Edwin Friedman tells the story of a man, and, and I'm going to call him Dan just for your your ease of understanding, who had given much thought to what he wanted from life. After trying many things, succeeding at some and failing at others, he finally decided that he wanted what he wanted. One day, the opportunity came for him to experience exactly the way of living that he had dreamed about. But the opportunity would be available for only a short time. It would not wait, it would not come again. Eager to take advantage of this open pathway, Dan, quote unquote, started on his journey. With each step, he moved faster and faster. Each time he thought about his goal, his heart beat quicker. And with each vision of what lay ahead, he found renewed vigor. As he hurried along, he came to a bridge that crossed through the middle of the town. The bridge spanned high above a dangerous river. After starting across the bridge, he noticed someone coming from the opposite direction, a stranger, seemed to be coming toward him to greet him. As the stranger grew closer, Dan could discern that they didn't know each other, but yet they looked amazingly similar. They even dressed alike. The only difference was that the stranger had a rope wrapped around many times around his waist. It stretched out, if stretched out, the rope would reach the length of maybe 30 feet. The stranger began to unwrap the rope as he walked. Just as the two men were about to meet, the stranger said, pardon me, would you be so kind as to hold the end of the rope for me? Dan agreed without the thought. He reached out and took it. Thank you, said the stranger. And then he added, two hands now, and remember, hold tight. 
At that point, the stranger jumped off the bridge. Dan abruptly felt a strong pull as the now extended rope slapped tight. He automatically held tight and was almost dragged over the side of the bridge. What are you trying to do? shouted Dan to the stranger below. Just hold tight, said the stranger. This is ridiculous, the man thought. He began trying to haul the other man in, yet it was just beyond his strength to bring the other back to safety. Again, he yelled over the edge. Why did you do this? Remember, said the other man, if you let me go, I will be lost. But I cannot pull you up, Dan cried. I am your responsibility, said the other. I did not ask for it, Dan said. If you let me go, I am lost, repeated the stranger. Dan began to look around for help. No one was in the, within sight. He began to think about his predicament. Here he was eagerly pursuing a unique opportunity, and now he was being sidetracked for who knows how long. Maybe I can tie the rope somewhere, he thought. He examined the bridge carefully, but there was no way to get rid of the newfound burden. So he again yelled over the edge, what do you want? Just your help came the answer. How can I help? I cannot pull you in, and there's no place to tie the rope while I find someone else who could help you. <coughs> Just keep hanging on, replied the dangling man. That'll be enough. Fearing that his arms would not hold out much longer, he tied the rope around his waist. Why did you do this? He asked again. Don't you see what you've done? What possible purpose could you have in mind? I know you're all thinking the same thing. Just remember, said the other, my life is in your hands. Now Dan was perplexed. He reasoned within himself. If I let go all my life, I will know that I let this other man die. If I stay, I risk losing any momentum toward my own long sought after salvation. Either way, this will haunt me forever. At, as time went by, still no one came. The man became keenly aware that it was almost too late to resume his journey. He didn't leave immediately. If he didn't leave immediately, he would arrive, he wouldn't arrive in time. Finally, he devised a plan. Listen, he explained to the man hanging below. I think I know how to save you. He mapped out the idea. The stranger could climb back up by wrapping the rope around his waist. The stranger would climb back up by wrapping the rope. Loop by loop, the rope would become shorter. But the dangling man had no interest in that idea. I don't think I can hang on much longer, warned Dan. You must try, repeated the stranger. If you fail, I will die. Suddenly a new idea struck the man on the bridge. It was different and even alien to his normal way of thinking. I want you to listen carefully, he said, because I mean what I'm about to say. The dangling man indicated that he was listening. I will not accept a position of choice for your life. Only for my own, I hereby give back the position of choice to your own, of your own life to you. What do you mean, asked the other guy afraid. I mean simply, it's up to you. You decide which way this ends. I will become the counterweight. You do the pulling and bring yourself up. He unwound the rope from around his waist and braced himself to be a counterweight. He was ready to help as soon as the dangling man began to act. You cannot mean what you say, the other man shrieked. You would not be so selfish. I am your responsibility. What could be so important that you would let someone die? Don't do this to me. After a long pause, the man on the bridge at last uttered slowly, I accept your choice. In voicing these words, he freed his hands and continued his journey over the bridge. I 
I don't know how I feel about that story. You and I, we want to help people. We want to help those people who have fallen off the bridge. I'm sure you have helped those people who have fallen off the bridge. Some of us have pulled them up only to find that they purposely jumped off another bridge. Once I had the rope and they were dangling, I would, I would feel guilty if I let go. How could I? I was a Christian. Wouldn't Jesus pull them up? If I did not pull them up, was I being selfish? We, we discussed this story multiple times, I think, as the elders. Um, and as I was working on this sermon, I thought, you know, those two men looked exactly alike, and they were dressed alike. The only difference is that one of them had a rope. What if it was he himself, just a mirror image? He was jumping off the bridge to sabotage his own new endeavor that he was heading toward at the other end of the town. Have you ever sabotaged yourself? Have you ever done something that you knew wasn't going to end well, that you knew was going to keep you from doing what you needed to do, and yet just had to do it? Did you ever let yourself fall? That's going to hurt. Back in the Garden of Eden, God told Adam and Eve about ownership. He said, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over every living creature that moves on the ground. That's Genesis chapter 1. Made in the image of God, we are created to take responsibility for certain tasks. Part of taking responsibility, part of taking ownership, is knowing what your job is and what it isn't. Do you ever take on duties that aren't your own? Do you ever cover for somebody who's not holding up their end of the deal? Do you ever burn out? It takes wisdom to know what we should be doing and what we shouldn't. We can't do everything. In your desire to do the right thing, do you take on problems that God never intended you take on? It's a problem of boundaries. You know, especially down here in Florida, everybody's got a fence around their property, right? So that's all the farther you got to mow. You mow to the fence. <laughs> the other guy's responsible for mowing their side of the fence. It's a boundary. And we got to put those on our lives. We got to have boundaries with friends, with family members, we have to have boundaries with those we work with. We have to have boundaries that may be different for different relationships and different people. But we need to establish them and we need to stand by them. Jesus, at a certain point, would just walk away from a situation. When he would do, be done 
ministering the way that he intended to minister in that situation, he said, okay, I'm done. And he would walk away. And he would work on himself for a little bit. It's a very serious problem facing Christians today. Many sincere, dedicated believers struggle with a tremendous confusion about when it would be biblically appropriate to set those limits. Do you have boundaries? Do you let people trample on your fences? Maybe your questions are like, can I be a loving person and still set limits? Yes. And, and what are legitimate boundaries? As a Christian man or woman, what are the boundaries that we need to set? What if somebody's mad at us about the boundaries we've set? What if they don't like the boundaries we set. How do I answer someone who wants all my time, all my love, all my energy, and mainly all my money? <laughs> Say no. <laughs> Why they, do I feel guilty or afraid when I consider drawing a line in the sand? How do boundaries relate to my submission to God? And if I set boundaries, aren't I being selfish? King David prayed this prayer. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Okay. Maybe somebody's taken advantage of your warm and fuzzy nature. Maybe they know you're a Christian and they think that's an opportunity to get stuff. Maybe they need to have you explain what you're willing to do and not willing to do. Maybe they need your prayers. Maybe they're ourselves. Maybe we're sabotaging our own future and the things that we want to do, and yet we're keeping ourselves from attaining those goals. Maybe we aren't listening to what God wants for us, and we've decided ourselves what we're going to do. The way to straighten those things out is through prayer, through time with God. Like I said when I was talking to the kids earlier, I said, look, what we have and what we think we have as goals for our life, that's nothing compared to what God has in, in store for us. What he wants for us far exceeds what we think we want. We spent time praying, saying, Lord, you know, fix this problem in my life and then everything will be behind and I won't bother you anymore. God wants to be bothered. He wants to shape every aspect of your life. He wants to, uh, to shape the relationships and things in your life. He wants to work in your life and in the life of your family, the life of your friends. He wants to work in the life of the people you work with. And he can do that through you. He can do amazing things, and he can work through you to do things that you don't even have on the horizon, the things you want to do. I just want you to take some time and pray. 
We've got uh, the prayer rails here that you can come to and the deacons will come and pray with you. Today's the day. If you're if you're walking without the Lord, this is a chance to bring him in and you'll have a partner in all that you do.